So uh, we've got a lot of things that are new this year. Uh, so just a few of the called out things uh, is the usual like big new version number type stuff, uh, 14s and 15s on here. But some other stuff to call out is 8K support across the range. I'll come back to 8K in a bit. And uh, further GPU optimized pipeline, which is a little bit technical, but well worth understanding uh, what that means. And the, the, the third thing that I'm really thrilled about is the total SRT support we have in the system. So uh, SRT, uh, hopefully some people will have heard a little bit about what that means, but we'll go into some details about what that is and how it's in our, our software during the course of this presentation. And then Andrew's got uh, actual interactive configuration demos uh, where he's going to do some, some streaming and show you how this changes the way you can design your broadcast pipelines and how you can reach audiences. Uh, the final thing to mention on what's new for this year is the Synergize KVM over IP. So this is <coughs> pardon me, something that's new for Synergy. Uh, this comes from the work we've done with the Daniel 2 codec that you'll have heard of from us at some points, which is our optimized GPU uh, and high-performance high CPU uh, codec that's designed for 8K and beyond. Uh, it, all, it turns out it works incredibly nicely then for delivering UHD uh, LAN IP KVM scenarios. So in our labs uh, back in Germany, we've been... Uh, creating software that uh, allows you to have a very low latency remoted KVM using gigabit ethernet. Uh, we're actually using uh, Synergize technology to stream this Prez PC into uh, the Facebook live stream. Uh, so we've actually got, <laughs> with some gaffer tape on, a small Synergize IP KVM box uh, on, taped to the, the telly there that's actually used to turn the output of these demo machines into IP signals, which we then stream onto Facebook uh, and stream up to our web page. So we're kind of demoing and using that there. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. But the, the, the keynote of this speech is to talk to you about our perceptions on the industry trends that happened at NAB. So particularly being uh, the wrong side of the Atlantic, not everyone is able to make it all the way over to NAB. Uh, unfortunately, I do have to go every year, it seems, uh, to the point where it was even written into my employment contract. Uh, and I'm you know, desperately happy not to go to Vegas anymore, having been there so many times. Uh, but the thing you do get to do is experience a feeling for what is the industry uh, doing as a whole, what, what's making people talk, what's drawing people's attention. Uh, and that every year you can kind of spot these themes, uh, IBC and NAB, about what's, what's drawing the industry's attention, what's drawing effort and investment uh, and excitement uh, and press releases. And in the past, we've seen such things uh, that have come along and stuck. Uh, for example, the introduction of uh, UHD channels and 4K in general, uh, and things that haven't stuck, for example, 3D having its go at doing these things again. Uh, so over time, we've seen you know, the rise and fall of various of these trends. Uh, and uh, it's interesting to see what's changing. It's always interesting to see where we are in the life cycle of these trends. And previous years, we've seen a lot of hype around uh, IP-based SDR replacement, things like SMPTE 2022-6 or 2110. And they're, they're had, these had been the things making the most significant noise uh, in the previous year. Uh, this year, that was much quieter. I think people are realizing that it's, it's much less a unicorn of excitement than they, they, they thought. Uh, and so we saw a lot more people actually genuinely caring about 8K. So we, I realized when I was actually out there and found some old equipment in a cupboard, we've been demonstrating 8K, genuine real 8K playback on our booth uh, since 2016. Uh, and the first time we did it, so many people were just like, why do I care? Why, why would I want that? Why do I care? Why is this important? You know, 4K was still what a lot of people were talking about at that point. Uh, and what was really interesting for me is having done it in 2016, 17, 18, and this was our fourth NAB with an actual 8K demo, this year people actually cared. People were genuinely thinking, OK, we've got the Tokyo Olympics coming up. Uh, we've got the introduction of actual 8K tellies you can buy in shops. Uh, uh, people were realizing that this is more of a thing that they might actually care about. So there was much more of a, uh, a, a care from people that aren't 
my boss, Jan, uh, at uh, NAB, because previously we've been outliers. Uh, and this year I noted that as you walked into the NAB convention hall uh, on a massive, on the Renaissance Hotel, if you've ever been, so a massive car park-sized banner was Blackmagic selling 8K video recorders and having 8K splattered across a giant hotel. So the level of acceptance to the industry that this is important is, is now reaching up where uh, we, we kind of hoped it would, having invested in making 8K technology work. So, you know, you couldn't move around the show floor without some people trying to sell you their new, shiny, introduced soon 8K stuff. Uh, and we had a lovely demo on our booth of uh, some 8K recorded uh, material, and you can see on our Facebook page an interview of me standing in front of this, uh, talking about 8K and uh, how that's important. Uh, perhaps one of the things that is also noted by people now is there has long been talk about how 4K would never work because no one can produce lenses that would be good enough. Uh, and 8K would definitely never work for the same reason. And now people are realizing that with tiny bits of plastic and glass on cell phones, some stunning footage comes out of these. So imagine what you can actually do when you have an actual lens that's big. Uh, so I, uh, we were looking at some 8K material uh, shot on a sharp camera, I believe, uh, with a very nice lens of some material. And, and it's the first demo I've ever seen where people are able to do the zoom in to then re-pan and re-scan. And it actually didn't look in any way compromised. We had zoom right into the guy's face and eyes, and then it finally started looking like just an HD picture. So uh, certainly in sports, certainly in uh, places where necessarily repositioning a camera isn't ideal, 8K is important to people producing in 4K because they can reframe the shot in a way that is really quite remarkable. Uh, and of course, with the increase in... Uh, acceleration of remapping of flaws and problems in lenses. There's a lot that can be done to work around uh, actual optical problems to bring that quality back up. So 8K is something that was really important for NAB and, uh, and, and had landed. And now you could actually get hold of equipment and cameras. And we literally went to Best Buy in, in America and bought an 8K telly. Uh, whereas previously we'd been going out there with like serial number four Dell monitors that were you know, custom loaned. Uh, so it's quite interesting to see that journey to acceptance. Uh, the other buzz topic for us at NAB uh, was SRT. So I, I did speak to people that aren't trying to sell SRT and 8K, and they did agree that you know, they were seeing a lot of uh, buzz around these topics, even people that aren't interested in, in these things. They may be working in a field that's unaffected by 8K uh, or SRT. And so uh, I was particularly thrilled about uh, the, the rise of people caring about SRT. Uh, it, it was more people that come from a, a technical background or an OTT streaming background that seemed most interested in this. So for those of you that don't know uh, what SRT is, it's secure, reliable transport. Uh, and it's a way of moving broadcast quality signals over the internet. Uh, so what we've done uh, to, to follow all these trends is make sure that uh, our products are ready for 8K in the next releases. So uh, 8K is now available inside our products to record. Uh, we have been off and connected up uh, SDI cameras using the Blackmagic 8K board uh, and, and begun working on these workflows to, to genuinely have that ready to go. Uh, and I'll drill into specifically what that means in a little bit when we get to Air's features. Uh, so to address, you know, we're excited about these trends being important because we, we now have 8K integrated into these. So it's nothing more exciting than in the dropdown, uh, there, there are listed 8K versions. Uh, it's not like it's a brand new piece of equipment you get to order from Amazon and have appear. Uh, but it, it's a very important step. Uh, but how, how do we actually make that work? Well, this is some of the stuff that we've had to do uh, to get there. So we've had to, in many cases, work to develop our own codec to get the speed and acceleration we need. Uh, so, uh, for example, even working in UHD, the Daniel 2 codec can help enable workflows where people have traditionally been perhaps struggling to get 10-bit uh, professional formats to decode in time. If anyone's ever worked with uh, XAVC or AVCI and its variations AVC Ultra, you will know how the, those codecs can bog down machines. Uh, so if you, once you go to uh, UHD 50 in 10 bits, uh, an XAVC 
uh, stream will be of the order of 800 megabits, and decoding it will be really quite painful on your CPUs. It's not, not GPU accelerated or acceleratable at all. Uh, so the Daniel 2 codec gives you an option to actually flip that material uh, ready for prep to load onto playout into our codec, at which point uh, we can either be faster in, in decoding on CPU or upload it into the GPU. And increasing use of GPU is one of those things that uh, helps us improve the efficiency of playout. So no one in this room here probably has a requirement to rush home and broadcast 8K. Some people in this room are broadcasting UHD 50 right now, uh, uh, or may wish to be broadcasting UHD 50 shortly. And everyone in this room has to deal with little old HD. So why does this matter to people that might not be going anywhere near 8K maybe in the next five or 10 years? It's because the enhancements we make in this make your HD channels and your UHD channels faster. So you can put more on one box or you can use cheaper boxes, uh, which brings trickle-down benefits to everyone uh, in, in that environment. So what we've done to achieve this is, is uh, further tune the GPU pipeline. So th this, this is uh, one of the things where I've, I've got quite a lot of information on some of these slides. Uh, obviously, we're recording this, so you'll be able to catch this back on Facebook later. Uh, so don't worry about scribbling too many notes. Uh, but the, and I've got a lot of information up here for people that are watching on, on YouTube or, or uh, Facebook later because they can kind of scan through slides. So I normally hate writing this much on slides, but being live streamed, I've, I've conditioned myself slightly. So uh, what we did in the launch of Air 12 is the Air, Air Engine uh, moved all of its compositing into the GPU. But in Air 12, uh, when we still have to get frames from somewhere to composite them and put them on. on, on. And uh, what we did support was uh, some accelerated GPU decoding, but we still need to actually move that to a single common point, which was the main computer RAM. Uh, and this is a limit. And we've got customers that have been working uh, in, in UHD 50 and been f finding that loading uh, on the machine uh, does hurt. Now, in HD, it's, it's almost not worth measuring. And because when you have eight HD channels, they can all work in kind of eight slices in parallel. Uh, you don't really see the problems you might if you're trying to actually run UHD 50, where everything has to be 20 milliseconds frames apart, and it's all one consistent whole. So you can't have, uh, a, a, on, on average, everything's performing perfectly. It needs to be, on a measure of one thing, everything's performing perfectly. So one of the enhancements we've made inside uh, Air 14, and it, it will make an, a big difference, as big a difference as those of you that move from Air 11 to 12, where we moved the pipeline to GPU for compositing, and CPU load dropped by 50%. It's not easy to get a 50% gain uh, in this industry, but we, between 11 and 12, it was generally a 50% drop in CPU load. If you enter into air in the way that is acceptable to the GPU, so in Daniel 2 formats, or HEVC or H.264 in 4220, then you can stay in the GPU now, and that remaining 50% of the CPU load basically goes. Your CPU will drop to kind of baseline a couple of percent. Uh, for UHD 50, which is an astonishingly low. It's, it, it's kind of normally, oh, we'll half it, then maybe we'll half it again. But because we've now moved the last half of the pipeline and optimized it to be uh, all the way through, we effectively leave the CPU with very little to do. It's not a case of doing something more effectively. It's actually just saying, well, don't bother doing it. We'll just reallocate your work. So your GPUs will work, work no harder because uh, that is genuinely just saying, well, let's not pass Bob the frame down here in the slow system RAM. We'll just keep it. Uh, so uh, it doesn't make your GPU work harder. They're still doing quite a bit of work. Uh, but again, GPUs have got normally quite a lot of capacity. Uh, so. Uh, by, by optimizing that, you should find that you'll, you'll be able to run loadings on Air 14 that make you think that the CPU is doing nothing. So for, for example, we are currently live streaming this camera, uh, these outputs, a uh, little webcam thing back there, uh, onto uh, Facebook and through to our webpage. 
So to do that, we're actually running a copy of Synergy Live on the machine. Now, we, we managed to break the machine that we were going to use, uh, and uh, it hadn't come back for t a time to be repaired. And we needed two PCI slots in the machine to be able to take the camera in, uh, because that's a, a camera that's SDI. Uh, and we also needed to have room for the NVIDIA board. So we've actually dug out what is of the order of a seven or eight year old PC to run this uh, workload on. So it's, it's a third generation quad core i7 machine that's running this HD channel uh, through Synergy Live, which is actually decoding two cameras and a, and a Synergize IP stream. Uh, we decided, because we wanted to set the Facebook streams up, to actually use the shared RAM technology from Synergy Live to let Synergy Air move the HD channel and encode it and send it up to uh, the Wowser streaming cloud. So when we enable or disable the Air engine, uh, which is using pure GPU pipelining in that case, to push it through, on that old quad-core i7, uh, we see the, the graph move around 2%. Uh, as we enable that HD channel. And that's on seven or eight year old hardware. So this stuff really does push down to being uh, beneficial, even to people that say, I don't want 8K, but I do want lots of HD. Uh, so that pipeline has become incredibly performant now. So the only thing to watch out for, of course, is anyone that's ever been involved in, in working with complex systems of any kind, uh, is this, this gives you all new places that you can move a bottleneck to. So uh, don't go thinking, oh, brilliant, you know, I now have a CPU doing almost nothing. Uh, let's put like 16 channels on here, because you might now find that your storage isn't fast enough on your the server, or you might find the network connectivity isn't enough. I have customers that have been looking at deploying some systems and they've, they've, they've forgot to remember that actually when they start recording to the lightly compressed formats, they've now got so many capture and airs on a machine, they don't have room on just a gigabit to send it, and they need to remember to put 10 gig nicks in the machine because they're <laughs> kind of like, oh, oh, whoops, yeah, we're actually sending out 800 meg of recorded uh, XAVC, and then we need to play a load back in. Uh, and so you've got to always bear in mind Fine, we might have effectively pulled that efficiency down, but don't forget, disks still need to do things, networks still need to move stuff around. So do be a little bit careful as you enjoy these efficiencies. Uh, what's great uh, as well in this case is virtualized GPUs in the cloud are very stable platforms to work on. You get an isolated fraction of card to work on. Uh, and so when you enable this mode on virtual machines, uh, then that works very, very well. I'm very much hoping uh, the AWS announced G4 workstations, we should be able to use the smallest of those. I don't know if they announced pricing at all, Mikey. Do you know? No. Uh, they were announced just the other week at the, an AWS event, but they, they should be of the order of a couple of bucks an hour. And those should be good enough to run a full UHD 50 channel on the baby. VM, uh, which is quite a remarkable improvement to see. Uh, so yeah, the GPU pipeline enhancement is how we make 8K work at all, uh, because it's quite tricky. Uh, but that, that does come down to everyone else that cares about this stuff. Uh, it's also the only way to have reliable UHD playout that we had last year, uh, and I can, I can mention this because it's in proof press releases, so with Glowcast, uh, we worked to get UHD 50 running from the AWS cloud. Uh, and it was the only way that that was ever going to work by using GPU. That was on Air 12. With Air 14, that it should be possible, the, the instances aren't available yet to, to verify it, but it should be possible to cut uh, what would be a $16 an hour VM down to hopefully of the order of $2 an hour uh, when Amazon announced pricing. That's where following on from what the previous instances cost should be that order there. So uh, with the enhancements of GPUs in the cloud, because there'll be a faster GPU to begin with, but coupled with that GPU pipeline, meaning we need less CPU, we can use smaller instances. Also, uh, Amazon did announce what's called the G3S instance. So that's where you get the same GPU, uh, but half the CPU. And again, in this mode, we're, uh, we, where we can remove the load from the CPU, that halves the cost. Uh, what's the G3S, Mikey, per hour gone? Let's just really make him work in the crowd. G G3S is what, 90 cents an hour? Something like that. It's, it's about half the price of the, the G3. Yeah, so uh, uh, yeah, by, by doing this also has real knock-ons for working in the cloud and, and your costs for running things up there. And uh, obviously that's, that's a direction that's only going to continue traveling that way uh, as GPUs get faster and, and, and more divisible up there. So it's very much ready for tomorrow. So... Uh, 
Then the other thing that we've talked about here is, I've just realized as well, I have no visible clock in my eye line whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Jason. Uh, so I, yeah, I should have spotted that one earlier. Uh, I'll pop that up for the next people that there's an actual clock in, in ISO. Ah, no, there is one through there. Cool. Uh, so SRT was the other thing that's really important. I'm really thrilled about this. So uh, this industry has been struggling for uh, ways to use the internet for broadcast compatible and broadcast capable uh, video delivery uh, for a, a good decade. And we've been working with some you know, loved and valued partners that have been trying to solve this problem. And lots of different people have tried to solve this problem in a proprietary way. Uh, the thing that makes SRT different is that uh, High Vision, uh, uh, an internet streaming and encoder specialist company, uh, they did the same thing that so many other people had done, which is invented a way of doing this uh, in their own manner, you know, extending some open source projects, but they, they came up with their own solution to the same problem, which many people had done over and over. But uh, a few years ago, about three years ago now, they teamed up with Wowzer, uh, the people that we're actually using to live stream our stuff through the Wowzer Media Cloud. Uh, they came, came up with those guys and said, look, let's, let's actually try and open source the way we make this work. Because if we do that, we can get an increase in capacity. So they formed uh, the SRT Alliance uh, with Wowzer and High Vision as the, the founding members and tried to see if anyone was interested. Uh, and we very, very quickly stuck our hand in the air and went, yes, we're very interested. Uh, as did... Uh, at the time, a good few dozen people when they first announced this uh, IBC and NAB a few years ago now. Uh, the, the last number I heard was it was over 120 people now, members of the SRT Alliance, vendors and uh, companies that are interested in making this work. That number's probably got higher since then uh, because it's, it, it, it's, it, it's increasingly climbing. Most interesting for me, which really underlines why this is important and why this was an NAB buzz thing, is uh, two companies that were able to formally announce they're joined. Were, one was Microsoft, who had been hiding in the background for years, but because of uh, you know, the, the requirements to go through processes internally could not join that alliance until they'd done all their paperwork and, and, and uh, got that signed off. But they formally joined the SRT Alliance, and Microsoft are a huge name to have attached to that. The other people that really caught my eye as having joined, amongst many, many other people, was Avid. So Avid have actually committed to uh, support SRT in their products, which again, in the broadcast industry, is a really huge name to have attached to this. And the list is nearly endless now of people that have joined this, uh, us being just one of them. But uh, for me, uh, the, the, that was really quite massive. Uh, and seeing the people that are involved in trying to get uh, uh, engaged in this, it just makes it ever more exciting. So uh, what was my standout thing to discover at NAB was this thing called SRT Hub, uh, which is uh, by High Vision, the people that originally brought us SRT, uh, but also in partnership with Microsoft because this runs on Azure. So this is something that we'll be getting engaged in and hope to be uh, showing uh, our capabilities for at IBC. So this is using the public cloud to enable you to click in an SRT stream. So say, for example, it could be this live stream. You could click into the SRT hub and then use uh, all of this technology and interconnect material on the backbone of Azure to globally distribute material uh, and video. Uh, so for example, one of the things we want to do is uh, add Synergy Multiviewer into the SRT hub cloud so people can have a few different SRT sources going up, but then they can turn on Synergy Multiviewer to take a quad split view of like, how are all those inputs looking in the cloud. Uh, similarly, we can use Synergy Titler in SRT hub to brand and put lower thirds and so on uh, onto signals that have come up. So we could do you know, live branding. Uh, so it's a really exciting thing. You know, it, it's very much a watch this space. So I mean, it, it, it's a request your private preview link on High Vision's web page. Uh, so you know, it's not live yet for general availability. Uh, but we're working and we're really, you know, this was shown publicly at NAB. You could, and we did, just walk up to it on the Microsoft booth and see it. Uh, and and you know, I've no reason to believe that's not going to be anything other than even more available and, and impressive come IBC. Uh, so you know, SRT, as a, as a piece of technology, to be able to let you take the output from your playout engine, the output from a random camera, the output from a multi-viewer, uh, to take all these signals and, and just move them over a, a normal network uh, is, is incredibly valuable. So 
Anyone that's worked on uh, Synergy Gear before and worked in IP will know that the default way of working in, in current versions of Synergy is to use multicast and transport streams. Uh, and that means you have to carefully manage the network that's got multicast on. You need to be quite cautious about often, you know, we generally re recommend people split the multicast video network away from the control network. Uh, so if people come on our training courses, and we were still running this way on the masterclass yesterday, we have laptops with two network cards each, which is a pain because we actually don't want to have to run two network leads to every laptop on a desk. Or if you're on one of our booths, uh, we have to uh, always make sure that our demo machines are cabled. Uh, we can't just use a Wi-Fi uh, plug. With SRT, even if we don't want to use the internet, but we just want to use Wi-Fi to move things around, that becomes quite possible. I'm also realizing now as I stand here and talk that my demo is on my mobile phone, which I lost somewhere towards Mikey. Yes, <laughs> so I'm just going to step forwards and grab my phone. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, we were over at NAB, and we actually rigged up a, uh, a playout engine in Nuremberg, Germany. And so uh, the great thing for me about SRT is not just that it does the job of stabilizing things, it's that it manages to uh, do it in an interoperable way. So we were going out there, and just before we went to NAB, the guys from High Vision said, oh, well, don't forget, there is our app on uh, iOS and Android called High Vision Play, and you can just install that for free and then look at uh, SRT streams. So we were like, oh, this is a brilliant way to just check that we've done it right, that we've integrated it correctly and it's working. So we went into the High Vision Play app, which I've got here on my phone, and just kind of registered the streams coming out of Germany. Uh, and so, lo and behold, we could click the button. This is where I like, haven't checked the streams this morning, and I hope no one stopped them. <laughs> Come on, play something. There we go. So uh, that demo uh, with around like half a second latency, it's defaulted to 500 milliseconds of uh, protection, down to my phone. So it, those of you that have tried to look at HLS streams or other browser-based streams to try and get a confident view on what's happening, you know, if you look at the multiviewer on our website, we tuned that as low as we could, and even that's about 20 seconds delayed, uh, to actually be looking at a, the, a turn stream that's of the order of you know, under a second. Uh, onto my mobile phone is quite a remarkable improvement. And this is just coming over my cell network here. I'm not even on any Wi-Fi here. Uh, so it gives you an idea of not only what you can do, uh, and this isn't your normal kind of slightly jerky adaptive internet stream. This is the original transport stream that could go into a muxa for broadcast, playing smoothly and locked and beautifully on my mobile phone. Uh, and it, it's also showing interaction between like High Vision and Synergy. And that's the beauty of VLC. You can take the URL streams we've got, and um, Andrew will go a bit more into this kind of stuff in his demos, and you can take something like VLC and just say, well, let's just see what VLC makes of this. Boom, there it is, it's playing. Uh, and for me, the, the power of that open standard and of that open source library to just include can't be un uh, underestimated uh, or can't be overemphasized because it, 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 making this available to everyone at no cost uh, changes the, the game entirely for how people can get, add this to their products. So uh, this means SRT is now supported in all Synergy products. Anywhere we could even think of half an excuse to add SRT to the product we did. So we added it just in time for NAB to have output from Synergy Air. And the demos went so well, before we'd even returned from NAB, uh, I'd got on the laptop, been talking to some of the developers, and we added SRT support into Synergy Root. Uh, and within two weeks of returning from NAB, uh, we'd managed to get enough of the internal staff as well to realize how cool this was, that it was actually in Multiviewer and Synergy Live and Synergy Capture as well. Uh, and added as an input to air uh, within two weeks of making it back. Uh, and that's a testament to how easy it is to integrate SRT as much as how everyone was quite awake and inspired when we got back. So Andrew's going to take you guys through some more practical demos of that rather than me just waving a cell phone. Uh, he's going to show you how to try and use that uh, because you know, uh, it, it, it really is incredibly powerful. There's no more need for any uh, you know, proprietary or paid for third party extensions. It's just something that we build in for free in every version of the Synergy products that supports it. Uh, uh, and it really does 
give you a, a good collection of tools that uh, enable you to change the way you can do stuff. We never considered live streaming this event until we got back from NAB and went, actually, we can just use SRT straight out of our products, and that goes straight into the Wowza Media Cloud, and it costs us like 15 bucks a month for a subscription. And then if we turned on the cheap pass-through, 13 whole cents an hour to stream out. Uh, on the transcoder. We've, we've gone for the expensive $2 an hour one to try and put the adaptive bit rates on, so no expenses spared on this stream. will be you know, of the order of $3.50 for this presentation. Uh, so yeah, it was great that we could literally just click into this whole CDN network uh, and it would just work. And similarly, that's how we're streaming on Facebook Live. So I certainly didn't want to have to go and figure out how to integrate with Facebook Live with Synergy Studio or Synergy Live. But I was thrilled when I could just literally click into uh, our, our apps and say, right, we will send to Wowza, Wowza will send to Facebook. Job done. So uh, yeah, really pleased about that. So demo time was me waving my phone around, which I've already done. Uh, so this is what it looks like. I just put a quick screenshot in here of literally uh, how we set up last night. So when, when we output from the uh, demo pod, so we can take anyone that wants to see this through this configuration over the way, uh, where we're actually, that is the webcam next door uh, in the Wowza Media Cloud uh, configuration page. Uh, Andrew's presentation will go through. Uh, do you actually go into the cloud? You do this, don't you? Uh, you need to let me know what not to show people before your presentation. Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah. So the point of Andrew's one is not to, to wow you with surprise, but to show you practically how could you do this and that it really works and it's not just lies. Uh, so. I'm trying to spin on before I, I overrun horribly all of my entire time slot because we'll have more tea and coffee and chance of people to engage with us uh, after this. Uh, so I'm just going to take you through some of the things that are in Air 14. So last night or yesterday, we uh, did uh, lock down and confirm Air 14 release candidate one. So I was literally shuffling through some of the paperwork last night to make sure we are now feature complete. There is no in-progress development on anything. Uh, there is no reason to believe that Air 14 could not release now. Uh, we're following the normal process where we believe we're done. Uh, and so we are presenting Air 14 as a release candidate online, hopefully today. Uh, I've not seen anyone telling me that's not going to happen. Uh, possibly some of my colleagues in our Ukrainian office watching this are thinking, no, shush. Yeah. But uh, we found a bug. We've got to stop. Uh, but uh, no, with, with, a, uh, with any luck, uh, Air 14 will be available to anyone that has uh, access to our partner downloads. Uh, so it's not got into the special beta area. It will, will go up today uh, as a, into the normal release area. It is a release candidate. Uh, so we know from experience that when people start putting these things out there, they will find new and interesting bugs that no one found in our test lab. Uh, we have customers on air. We have some very important customers on air with Air 14 right now, not by choice, by necessity. Uh, so uh, I, I can't necessarily say you should all drop everything and rush live your channels tomorrow on Air 14. I would not be pleased with that happened. Uh, but uh, you know, we have customers on air with Air 14 right now. Uh, we have a really high quality product and it's available for people to download. Uh, like I say, hopefully today. Uh, we, we went through the process last night, the release notes were written, uh, the, 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 the online site was all checked to make sure we haven't got any weird, weird things hanging over we forgot about. And uh, we've begun working on Air 15. That's normally a very good indication that 14 is ready. So uh, yeah, the big thing for me today is that yeah, that should be accessible to people. But so this isn't just a, hey, what's coming? This is a, no, you can actually go and play with this tomorrow at home you know, on a lab machine uh, or uh, begin to prepare. I mean, I would strongly uh, love people to actually pop this in the lab as if they were going to roll it out. And then either people will actually come back and say, no, it really, you know, for the first time ever, someone has made no bugs. Uh, would be shocking, but uh, you know, the, it, go through the process as if you were ready to test it to verify that it will roll out, uh, and then you know, it, 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 there's no reason to believe this one couldn't roll out. Uh, experience tells me some people will register some bugs, and we will find some issues and fix them. Uh, so you know, as with any .0 release, people might sit there and think, yeah, maybe I'll hold out, but uh, the intention is to have the release candidate label removed within four weeks. Uh, so there is, we're doing nothing else to it. It really is just 
anyone want to tell us anything that is broken because uh, we haven't found anything. We're running it right now. That's how this is streaming. Uh, we used it at NAB, uh, and we have some seriously scary large deployments actually using it as well in production. So yeah, please don't necessarily add to that number very quickly, uh, but you know, in a couple of weeks, why not? So let's have a look at the major changes. So there will be a blog post. Uh, I sat down last night very cavalierly thinking, oh, cool, well, I'll just pull together the blog post of what's new because I, I wrote the last one for Air 12 a year ago. Uh, and then I realized how long that blog post was, and it was already half past nine. And I just went, no, I'm going to save that as a draft, and I'll promise to do it by the end of the week. So uh, the blog post does not exist, although RC, RC1 won't be held up by the blog post because the release notes are all prepped, uh, and the manuals will begin going online uh, over the course of the release candidate. Uh, Excellent, excellent. I'm glad I stayed up late helping prep them last night then. So, so uh, is that some live Facebook feedback by any chance? Yeah, excellent. Oh, brilliant. So, uh, so yeah, I'll take you through some of the major changes quickly on here. Uh, so as I mentioned before, 8K, I mean, in terms of screenshots for 8K, all we can really do is go, look, it's a drop down that's got 8K in it. There's no, no, nothing more impressive you can put in a PowerPoint slide, uh, but it's there. Uh, and uh, we support the Blackmagic 8K Pro uh, deck link board. So we have genuinely used that board. I mean, as usual, the, you know, that's a relatively new board out there. The first time we plugged it into a camera, the camera somehow managed to invert fields that never existed. So, you know, as usual, uh, be ready in a lab to verify that you've got everything working properly uh, if you're going into uh, playing with 8K, because literally firmwares on cameras and, and boards at this point mo need to be carefully managed and monitored because it's also bleeding edge. Uh, but 8K IP with Daniel 2 is also supported uh, in this package. Uh, it, you know, it is early days for 8K, so uh, this is what is important is we've reached the milestones of people being able to really put this in a lab and get some hands-on experience uh, outside of our special labs uh, and see where they are. I, I, I would be a bit worried if people start then going, brilliant, well, uh, let's plan for a week next Tuesday we launch the 8K channel on Synergy Air 14. That, that would leave me nervous. Uh, please perhaps engage with the professional services department if you really have a burning urge to try and do that and have it all work. Because uh, these 8K is big numbers in frames, in bandwidth, in disk space, in you know, network cards. It's, yeah, you might need a little help. But it's there in the release. As I mentioned previously, SRT encapsulated IP input and output. So you can stream into an air engine in SRT as a live input, and it can then output again. Uh, and that's how we're sending things to our front of our website, where I, I keep putting interesting things in the top left corner of our multi-viewer, which this morning was a, a shark with a laser beam on its head. Uh, so yeah, just that's, uh, to that top left corner on our web page is, is where I have like a secret input to our uh, demo multiviewer, and I, I quite often route interesting things onto it. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, SRT input and output that is there in Air 14, it works really nicely. I would highly encourage people to play with this. Don't also forget that Synergy Air includes Synergy Studio, uh, and Synergy Studio is a brilliant way for doing like clips play in or other stuff that isn't a linear channel. It's the same engine, and it can be a very nice way to. Uh, contribute streams, to contribute inputs, uh, and also if you need to do things, strange things like be on a laptop on Wi-Fi. Uh, you know, SRT works really well on Wi-Fi. In our office, we streamed uh, a, a Daniel 2 HD stream at 70 megabits, uh, just because we were looking for something to be really ridiculously big on Wi-Fi. And so we did successfully use SRT to stream 70 megabits over Wi-Fi in our office. I mean, that's not to say someone couldn't then show up with four iPads and then break it or something, but uh, yeah, we did it. Uh, so uh, if you can control your environments, uh, it, it really is an interesting technology. Uh, Flicking through my list a bit more, just reading my bullet points, I just picked out the things that I was most interested in here. Uh, there's specific HDR support inside uh, Air Pro. Uh, this is where we're starting to add in HDR to SDR mapping. So you can define a channel specifically as being HDR. Uh, and then uh, work out how you might want to emit, say, an HDR variant and an SDR variant of a UHD channel. Uh, HDR remains incredibly complicated, and we continue to watch globally as broadcasters tie service providers in knots over HDR and just say, but I want it HDR, and then the service provider goes, what do you mean by that? I went, HDR? 
And uh, so then there's like a, we're seeing a big knowledge gap between people that say they want the ticky box, yes, it's HDR, and being able to actually work to produce that. Uh, it, it's more complicated than when people went SD to HD, because even the simplest wobbly-headed manager like myself could understand the concept of, like, there are more pixels. Uh, the, the, the concept of HDR and the different competing Dolby Vision versus uh, yeah, the... Uh, a hybrid log gamma, all this stuff is much more confusing and complicated. Uh, and, and sometimes people just kind of throw their hands up in the air and go, screw it, we'll set the output to 10 bit and then just hope that no one ever really questions it because probably the telly you're looking at it on at home isn't OLED, so you can't tell anyway. So, because uh, you literally can't see it without OLED. Uh, so we, we've continued to push the boundaries in this though and we're very ready to work with customers on improving that uh, and particularly around their HDR workflows so we've got quite a lot of experience in this space from what we can tell so far more experience than every single broadcaster we've tried to work with on this because all they have is more questions than they have requirements uh, so treat it with caution but uh, we're, we're ready for it and we've further improved what Air can do with it uh, I mentioned the GPU pipelining stuff. Some other call-out stuff here that's interesting is HEVC 10-bit B-frames. So for people in particular that are working on UHD, B-frames is really interesting. So the latest NVIDIA technology lets you get B-frame encoding from Synergy Air. Uh, word of warning, it will look like you can do B-frames on boards that don't support it, and then the engine won't start. So it used to be, when there was no such thing as B-frame encoding NVIDIA, we wouldn't let you pick the drop-down because it was just impossible in all circumstances. Now it's possible in some circumstances, you might go clicking it to B-frame and then wonder why the engine won't start. If you look in the air you should see a message, but uh, yeah, be, be careful. You, you can hang yourself by asking it to do things that are impossible on the NVIDIA board you have. Uh, but we'd expect a 20 to 30 percent bitrate saving for the same comparative quality with B frames on, uh, or similarly, you can just expect a 20 to 30 percent quality boost by turning B frames on. Uh, I mean, I've been streaming uh, when you've got progressive, nice shot, well-lit progressive input, like those test clips on my mobile phone. Uh, HD at 3.2 megabits in HEVC looks really pristine and nice. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, the HEVC features continue to be really nice and useful and interesting, particularly when you're trying to stream things from the cloud, for example, and you're paying per gigabyte. Uh, you know, the, those features are great. Boring but, in, but useful feature is SCSI 104. So we're seeing more and more customers using SCSI 35, the IP-based signaling for you know, an IP equivalent of GPIs. Uh, we actually now will transparently simplify, come out by setting avail IDs and so on. Those will be inserted in the SDI the same way they're inserted in the IP, which is you know useful. Uh, we have actually made some dramatic enhancements to the I.O. performance of Synergy Air. So we've rewritten, in order to support 8K, uh, so my boss got this footage of a crazy looking green Joker man that Jenny loves, that you can see in some of my videos from NAB. And uh, it, it, Jan really wanted to show how fast the Daniel 2 codec was. And it turns out when you've got like 8K material at 10 bit, uh, even when you encode it, you, you, it, when we can achieve of the order of 200 frames per second of, of 8K decoding on a, a GeForce 1070-ish board or, or no, RTX 2070-ish board. Uh, so we actually started completely destroying the SSDs in the machines. So we actually rewrote the way that uh, we read media because we were, we were uh, hitting roadblocks around 1.5 gigabytes a second, gigabytes. Uh, and we needed to, to actually do 170 or 200 frames per second of, of 8K. We needed something like four and a half to six gigabytes a second, which is not a small amount. So the guys actually rewrote uh, the way that we read material from disk in air. Uh, and that actually can have knock-on benefits uh, uh, in some circumstances, even all the way down to XDCAM 50. So uh, you know, we have a customer that is, is live with Air 14 because of some storage issues, and the way we've rewritten it happened to kind of paper over uh, some high latency storage issues. So it's worth calling out because the behavior of Air will, will be different if you're using some kinds of storage. Uh, some, it, you won't notice a blind bit of difference. Uh, over the network, generally, it won't matter. But uh, certainly on local disk or on SAN attached material, it can behave quite differently. Uh, and the other couple of things on this list that's worth calling out, great for demos, is webcam support. So we actually have a webcam like over the way there. 
I don't want to go broadcasting it to anyone, but if I'm trying to like simulate things or just need some dirty live input to do something with, uh, or we're training on laptops and we've all got webcams, uh, Air can just accept this webcam as a, a very crude input uh, for seeing things. We actually found this is so useful, we've added the webcam support into MultiViewer 15. The idea being you can just have a rack full of gear and if you want, just stick a webcam in, which will then be available on a quadrant or a you know, corner of MultiViewer. And if you're trying to guide someone through, hey, can you just go and check that box is working right, just grab the webcam and point it at the, at the rack. Uh, like, what machine was supposed to be broken? I don't know, grab the webcam and point it, I'll look at it on the MultiViewer as you move it around. Or similarly, just a, a cheeky little webcam on a USB extender looking back across at a gallery of screens. So uh, the webcam stuff, while it was put in, in initially just to save someone some effort moving gear around the world to do a demo, uh, it's actually proved really useful and, and uh, uh, helpful inside, to the point where we're abusing a webcam as our extra wide camera on this live stream. So uh, that's actually a 70 buck camera from PC World uh, that we cut to uh, away from the multiple thousand pound Blackmagic camera that we're on most of the time. And it doesn't do a bad job. Uh, and certainly for kind of journalists or people just that don't have ridiculously high requirements in, in their quality input, that, that camera does really quite well. Uh, so that's added. Uh, WDM, uh, Windows something something. I don't know what it means. I should have looked that acronym up. Uh, but it, it, WDM devices mean if you want to play with a board that we haven't integrated properly, uh, then you can select the boards if you just install the Windows driver. I think it's Windows driver model. Uh, but so, for example, uh, we got some really interesting boards from a, a company in Taiwan that's in the Synergize box, and they have Windows drivers. And we didn't need to go through the SDK to integrate them. We can just pick them through the WDM streaming mode. Yeah, WDM just means that if you've got, if, win, if, if you can stream it into Skype, Basically, you can stream it into, uh, into Synergy. So uh, if you've got some strange encoder boards of some kind, oh, thank you, very kind man. Yeah, uh, then you, you can actually have an experiment by picking WDM. Uh, you know, it might work, it might not, depending upon the board. I mean, we literally got shipped this stuff, these experimental HDMI 4K boards, uh, put the drivers on and they just worked. Uh, so you know, if you've got a reasonable board, then it, it should also just work for you. Ah, and then the final thing I've thrown on here, because some contribution encoders do, do like it, is we have added an option to turn on simply 2022-1 forward error correction on your classic transport streams. We actually did this before SRT started working properly for us. Uh, and so there are some encoders out there that like what, what was called the Pro MPEG FEC, uh, or is now labeled with SMPTE numbers, uh, the forward error correction, so that if you're using transport streams in a more traditional way, you can send kind of extra error correction with it. And if you lose a few packets, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we are not intending to add that support as inputs to Synergy because we've got SRT. Uh, but for some devices where you don't have a choice, they might say, we, we, we need this. There are some Nevion devices the BBC use, for example, that need this. Uh, this is also supported by Amazon Media Connect. So we, we added it for those situations where uh, people may require it. And that's available as an output. You just tick that on, uh, and that will then create the parity stream for you. Uh, so devices that support it will receive it. One of the other things we've done, so this is just a, a quick example. I mean, there are so many changes inside the, 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 the tool. I'm not going to walk you through them all. But something people have asked for for a long time is, is uh, they've often said, can we, can we change the color of the line? And we've been very resistant to that, because the color of a line in air means something. And we want that to mean the same thing, no matter where on Earth you are, or no matter where you're remoted into to do things. Uh, if people literally changed the color of what's selected to what's on air, our support team could cause some serious problems for you if like, the colors have all inverted and they thought they were just changing what was selected uh, while they were looking uh, and, and it's all gone wrong. Uh, so, uh, but what we did have added uh, is the ability for people to have a color category column. So if you want your colors, you can have them and you can have them near where you're at and you can set them to any level of purple you want, uh, but uh, it, it will just affect that column. Uh, so if anyone's used color categories in Outlook, uh, that's, that's where it's kind of similar to. Uh, so you can have them just as plain colors, or you can have them appear with uh, words as well. Uh, so you can, you, know, you can either just know that red is bad, or you could write re the, 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 the 16 plus could appear inside the uh, category. And it's just a drop down, as you can see here, to set them. 
So that's something that can be set by operators genuinely working on it, uh, or it can be set in through traffic integration. So if you've got some kind of color importation scheme that customers want you to use, or that operationally makes sense for you, so you can glance and see our things, uh, you know, is, that, is that commercial, is that uh, movie or whatever, uh, it, this can be helpful to people. So that's a, a screenshot, just because who doesn't like screenshots in long, endless presentations? Uh, so uh, we can show you this over the way. Uh, there, the other uh, interesting change to air control is titler objects can now be a primary event. So this is a, a truly awful, uh, like I don't know who chose that particular cyan color to put on a terrible yellow gradient. Uh, but uh, what, what you can now do in uh, air is you can treat the graphic scenes as entire objects. So if you've got, say, an emergency slate or any kind of promo thing that you don't have an MXF for, but you do just have the title scene for, and it makes most sense when the whole thing is full screen uh, rather than just a corner strap, uh, you can drag them into the playlist and then treat them as objects. You can give them duration. Uh, and what you, now they've supported audio since version 12, uh, uh, effectively, you can have kind of synthetic clips uh, that are drawn out of titler objects that can have you know, their own audio bed on them. Uh, or more importantly, if someone's putting an emergency slate on, for example, if you do it this way for a, as, as a primary event rather than as a secondary event, it will trigger the suppression of the uh, audio of the item that you're coming on. So it's great to pull an emergency slate up if you know, there's been some something no one wants to see that's come on screen. You can press the button on Synergy CG to throw a, a slate up. But if, if that's accompanied by lots of swearing underneath it, someone then needs to kind of pull the fader down or remember to do something with that. Uh, whereas if you've got a primary event, you can literally just drag an item in and, and, and queue it, and it will suppress. Uh, the, you know, it, it's its own item. Uh, amusingly, you can then put secondary events of Titler on top of Titler being a primary event, but that's just going crazy. Uh, so yeah, there, uh, there is also a uh, change to, uh, I don't have a screenshot of it, but uh, those of you that have ever tried to remember whether they should hold down Alt or Control or Shift when replacing items in Synergy to remember which one does what, uh, I can never remember. Uh, like Control would replace it, Alt would replace it in a different way. I, I never knew which one to click. I just try a few in, until I got the one I wanted. Uh, now you always just control drag and a dialog pops up asking you how would you like this to be inserted? Do you want to replace all items? Do you want to replace just this one? Uh, do you want to keep secondary events or throw them away? Uh, so uh, do try uh, control dragging onto your playlist now. Uh, and uh, instead of just kind of something happening and you're not sure why, and then trying Alt and trying Shift to see what happens, uh, life will be much clearer uh, as it uh, has an all new dialogue there. Uh, Quickly stepping through because I am running out of time, so I'm going to go a bit faster. Uh, there are all sorts of changes to the titler. So uh, the uh, titler 15 is uh, available in Air 14. With we are actually intending to move the numbers when we get a chance, and you'll start to see some things having it already to year-based modes. So everything stops being everything used to be synchronized. Then they were didn't have to be synchronized, so now they're just confusing. Uh, and at some point, we will move things completely to, you know, this year, everything would be coming out at version 19. Uh, and next year, things would be 20. Uh, so that will be simpler then. But at the minute, uh, Air 14 includes Title of 15. <laughs> so uh, the, the, we've continued to enhance that. We've now end of life uh, type. That's no longer support, sub officially supported by us in uh, Air. Uh, it won't ship by default at all and would need to be re-enabled through negotiation. Uh, so uh, but we have, as we, we've further enhanced the multi-channel DVE, so if people haven't seen that demo before, you can now take multiple live things to do like a picture-in-picture multi-wobbly head talk or uh, to have, like, we could have actually had this screen up full screen and then me as an inset, for example, using that. What is different is with desktop 14, it's fully integrated. So with desktop 12, you'd still see type when you added things. With 14, it's all integrated in. And uh, uh, so it's end-to-end -end integrated. We've added support for having uh, little pictures uh, available. Pictograms, image A, and so on can be added in line in text. 
and we've tried to make life a lot easier for people doing things with uh, macros and variables. So if you go and work inside the, the editor now and you start, you want to try and type in a macro to link a variable into a string, it starts kind of saying autocomplete type stuff. Like, Did you mean you know, item.name or program. Uh, comments? And it will fill in values and help you understand a lot more clearly what, what are you actually trying to do in terms of in injecting these things. It's quite a big difference in terms of leading you along with that. Uh, so, uh, oh yeah, we've also further improved its uh, tuning. So those of you that will have been working some years ago on things like Air 9 and Air 10 with Synergy Type will know that the easiest way to make an HD channel struggle would have been to enable the branding because it would instantly double the CPU load at least uh, and could be a, a very quick path to making problems on air. Uh, we're, with all the enhancements to 12 and now with 14 with its further GPU pipelining, uh, generally when you enable a title scene now, you see no change on the CPU at all. It's all part of the unified compositing engine. So it, it, adding branding doesn't generally cause much cost at all. Uh, do be careful when going and dragging and dropping massive MXFs into the scenes, for example, because uh, they still have to be played. Uh, but generally, if you're, if you're somewhat economical, uh, you should find that uh, the branding doesn't really have any material cost on the engine. Uh, I'm going to have to speed up a lot because I'm, I'm running way under uh, uh, over here. So desktop 14 is new. Title is integrated, type's end of life. There is social media publishing, so uh, we can now more, in a more streamlined way, publish to, to YouTube and Twitter. Facebook have gone a little bit like, ooh, no, we're not going to let people auto-publish stuff anymore. So the Facebook stuff has stopped working already because Facebook have already changed the APIs on it. Uh, so uh, we've been playing around with the way that subclipping works uh, and MXF files in document bin. So we've just been continually tuning and improving it. We've uh, improved the look and feel a bit more. Uh, we've replaced the spell checker, which is nice because it was about a 15-year-old spell checker inside the old system. So the spell check engine is better. What does that look like? So here is uh, what Titler looks like when it's embedded in a bit document bin now. So it gives you a very easy way to work with the YouTube, so you can have a very streamlined way of entering metadata and have things push up to YouTube. Uh, this is an interesting one. So uh, we've changed the way that master roles work just for the first time. This has sort of changed significantly in 15 years or so. Uh, so now you can have this view where you can see a list of all the entires. The, an entire is a contiguous block of time code. So you might have just one in a role, or you might have multiple ones where people have actually ingested uh, like breaking time code, say from a, a, a camera on time of day. Uh, so now you can have it in this mode and then click the entires and see just the clips related to that block of time code and further clip within there. So that's a, an interesting change. Uh, speeding through along as well, Capture 14. Uh, so we've got 8K support. We now have AAF files available for MXF recording, uh, which can make that easier for uh, dragging and dropping into Avid. Uh, Custom watermark imprinting, so if you have a proxy that you want to have a branding on, uh, you can configure that in Capture to uh, do that at creation of just that proxy. Uh, we've messed around with the way that uh, time codes split at midnight. XAVC 100 is supported for HD. Uh, we can now produce transport stream outputs, which is an interesting, you know, sometimes people have this requirement, we can do it now, uh, because they're particularly popular in the States in doing that, I don't know why. Uh, uh, we've optimized the way that we create uh, OP1As so that we there is a problem with OP1As that are in edit while record mode where the longer they get, the longer they can take to actually initially load. So we've added an all new way where we can still work in that compatible way, but Synergy will load them uh, in a second or two, even when they're a few hours long. Uh, you don't get this problem if you're using Synergy end to end because we're, we're permanently updating the indexes anyway. But if you're just freestanding recording, uh, we have this optimized way that without the Synergy Archive integration, we can write to an OP1A and Air and Studio can load even a clip that's two hours long in just a second or two while it's ingesting still uh, without the database. Uh, SRT input is supported, which is brilliant because everyone loves SRT, particularly me. Uh, and we've added H.264 MXFs 
So, so uh, we can now generate 264 in MXF, so you can run that at, say, a lovely 25 megabits and have a pristine, gorgeous MXF that's half the size of an XDCAM 50. Uh, or you can set it to kind of 3 meg and have uh, a, a, a proxy, but still in an MXF container, which some people do have a very good reason for. Uh, not least because uh, you can then actually work with those proxies while they're recording still. If you write to an MP4, uh, it's a nightmare to try and actually view them while they're recording still. Uh, we've continued to improve the performance, as usual, massive performance tuning because of GPUs being awesome. Uh, we've got a monitor panel that makes it easier to see the health and status of things. So when you click on a channel, you can see uh, how many errors there might have been during the course of that recording. Uh, I have some pictures of that in a minute. I'll actually go past those because I'll bring the pictures up. So you can now enter this new mode here where you can actually see specific uh, details of like what's the CPU usage on this machine, so it's turned yellow at 70%. Really interesting is I can see the GPU usage and the buffer usage. So we've had various customers that uh, have said to us a few times, I hit stop, and then it takes ages to stop. And the reason is, is uh, the storage is just too slow. And we've started writing onto the machine locally uh, just to, it's better than crashing and stopping. Uh, but no one would know when they hit stop. The reason the engine still isn't ready to go again yet is because it's still trying to finish writing its files. With 14, you can now see a visual interface uh, uh, to see 2% you know, of my encoder buffer is used. Uh, so these buffers all need to drop to zero before the session is stopped. Uh, similarly, if you manage to screw up enough, uh, they will overflow eventually. So if you literally unplug the network cable on Synergy Capture, you will start to see uh, the file buffer just filling. And it'll take minutes to fill all the way, but when you plug the network cable back in, if you, if you then hit stop, uh, you, you shouldn't be surprised when the, it won't let you start recording again until that number trails all the way down to zero, because it means your file hasn't made it onto the storage yet. Uh, so it's much easier to understand what might be going wrong uh, with your recording sessions with this detailed view, which is very cool. Uh, and that's just it in a different view where you can have that bigger and those under there. And yeah, just more details, yay. Uh, and then I'm going to kind of, oh, well, I can't move over this. The other thing about NAB is we managed to win uh, product of the year for Synergy Multiviewer. Uh, so uh, it was really quite uh, cool to have uh, the, the team come back from the award having managed to get product of the year. What was the category? Can anyone remember? It was IP, IP infrastructure. Cool, so product of the year for IP infrastructure, which is really nice because we've been working with IP infrastructure for, well, I joined Synergy what will be 10 years in November, and we were already, had been shipping products for a while with IP integration 10 years ago. So it's really quite nice to kind of see some people noticing that now. And the multiviewer is very cool and has a lot of capability and is still just software. So uh, we have some preview versions of MultiView 15. That's what's running on our website to do SRT stuff. So as you'd expect, 8K, SRT, Daniel 2 IP input support, which is quite cool. Decklink 8K support, SIMT 2110 support, which is very experimental because 2110 is special. Uh, and then uh, one of the things we're adding to MultiView 15 at the minute is color bar and tone detection and alarming, uh, which is one of the a new feature that's just come up. So I'm hoping that that was one of my last slides. Oh yeah, I'll just quickly tell you guys about the Synergize stuff. So I mentioned it earlier, so the use case isn't necessarily broadcast here, it's any way you need to uh, take high-end uh, collaboration or, or workstations, so if you've got a UHD screen with high-end CAD CAM stuff on uh, and you wanted that remoted, it's actually really hard to get a decent KVM system that works up to, well, it works nicely with HD, but that works with UHD, it's, there's a real gap in the market. So. Uh, you can, I mean, I hesitate to, to use this comparison, but you could think of uh, Synergize as being just a, a very high-end, quite high-bandwidth version of VNC. Uh, so you can run uh, the little tool, and it's either a receiver or a sender on two ends, uh, and you just choose one's going to connect to the other, and then it actually will remote the keyboard and mouse, but it will then actually send uh, you know, UHD 50 or 60 uh, screen remoting uh, across the, uh, the, the target is to have that running nicely under a gigabit, uh, so it will go on normal gigabit lands. Uh, but the, unlike with other systems where it, it all looks great until someone tries to watch a video on it, this is designed from the beginning so that we expect someone to be watching full screen UHD 50, 60 video on their PC and it still looks just as good. So when they're moving around in CAD or CAM uh, or doing presentations. Uh, kind of expects to work well uh, in, in that end. And then if someone does just 
bring up a static page of Facebook or something. It, it carries on working. Uh, it's not designed to be something that you would use for kind of fixing your mum's computer over the internet. For that, please do keep using AnyDesk or TeamViewer or things like that, you know, those target lower bitrate scenarios. This is for when you've got an edit station downstairs in a server room and you want to bring it upstairs to a quiet suite. That's where this fits in. We didn't manage to get a demo of this setup uh, out there. If anyone really cares, we can kind of download a version of it and give it a whirl. I have used it uh, before in the office, but uh, it's it's uh, being heavily changed at the minute, ready to uh, be be put out there for people to actually download a trial. Uh, so the guys have been messing with the user interface a bit for establishing connections. So that I won't read through all these bits uh, is effectively that, and I will yeah I'll I'll park that on there. So the the other thing that we do here in the UK is uh, this is the headquarters for Synergy Professional Services. Uh, so me, Mikey, Jason, and Simon are all part of the UK team uh, that work in professional services as uh, our primary goal. Me a bit less so because I'm also head of product management, so I try to dodge the work. Uh, we've also got Yaroslav, who is probably watching this. Hi, Yaroslav. He's in exile in the Ukraine at the minute uh, due to some... some uh, home office issues. Uh, so we're, <laughs> we're working to get those sorted. Uh, so uh, uh, you, uh, those of you, obviously, most of you probably live here in the UK, might have noticed our government's a little bit broken at the minute, and uh, it seems also a little bit slow at filling out visa forms. Uh, so uh, we're based in the UK, and one of the things we've done over the last year is increasingly work with customers on professional services. So please do make the most of this uh, event to pick our brains, to realize that we are actually not completely stupid, uh, and that as you guys work to see how you need to transform your business, need to make steps forward, we can be here to support you now through uh, a, a professional services engagement uh, where you can actually pay us to do things on your behalf, uh, or to explain things, or to write up documents or to make make software work the way you want or design things. Uh, so that is us, uh, and hopefully uh, you will leave the end of the these two days, the end of today, uh, feeling that we do have at least half a clue uh, and may be willing to work with us a little bit more. So thank you all very much. I'm going to stop at that point there because I'm now 10 minutes.